My name is Phoebe Vallanos and um, I'm an assistant professor of industrial and systems engineering and uh, computer science at uh, USC. Um, and uh, today I'd like to, uh, oh, before actually I guess starting my talk, I want to thank the organizers, so Bistra, uh, I don't see Pascal and Andrea and Xavier, um, uh, thank them for the invitation. I'm really uh, excited to be here to share a little bit um, about our work. Um, so what I uh, will focus about today is um, part of my um, uh, group's work on integer optimization for uh, both predictive and prescriptive analytics in uh, high-stakes uh, settings. Um, the core motivation uh, for my work is the fact that we're increasingly using automated data-driven uh, systems for making decisions or for supporting at least decision-making in uh, high-stakes settings. Um, you know, we've all heard about hiring. Um, we're uh, increasingly using decisions to make prioritize uh, uh, using ML to make prioritization decisions. For example, to prioritize people for scarce uh, COVID-19 treatments. Or um, in my group, we're using um, uh, data-driven approaches for prioritizing people experiencing homelessness for scarce housing resources. So um, as we start to deploy these systems in, in high-stakes settings, um, there's various things, obviously, we should be um, thoughtful about. Um, uh, the three aspects that I've looked at, and there are certainly more, are um, fairness, first of all, right? As we're uh, deploying uh, this system, for example, to make decisions on who to prioritize for uh, housing among people experiencing homelessness, we want our um, ML to satisfy certain fa fairness requirements. And this may be different from one application to another. Um, and since um, these systems are going to be impacting people's lives, people life, people's livelihoods, um, uh, we want them, of course, to be fair, ideally to not um, a, a create more harm, but also perhaps try and mitigate uh, some of the her historical harms. Um, a second um, desirable um, characteristics of our systems is, of course, interpretability. So here I'm very much a proponent of uh, Cynthia Rudin's view that, you know, we shouldn't have to explain um, uh, how decisions are made and why they're made. Instead, we should have uh, systems that are like not black box that uh, a human can just see and understand uh, how they make decisions. Um, and, and the last um, desirable characteristics of, of systems we're going to be deploying in high stakes settings is um, optimality slash robustness. I've lumped these two together here. Um, a, a, we'd like our systems to make decisions that are as good as possible or predictions that are as accurate as possible because when we're using them to uh, make decisions about people's lives, obviously, you know, uh, even a one percentage point can, can make a difference. Um, uh, on the robustness side, you know, because we're going to be deploying um, our systems in settings um, where perhaps we have unmodeled phenomena, we um, may not have taken into account all possible uncertainties. Uh, oftentimes, we have uh, collaborations between uh, uh, technical teams and non-technical teams that work in uh, tandem, and that may uh, cause distribution shifts. Uh, we'd like to have methods that are going to uh, perform, have performance guarantees, basically and that are going to perform as planned and intended. Um, all of my talk today is going to be focused on learning decision trees, either for uh, prediction or for prescription. So either uh, in the machine learning context or to make decisions and uh, assign interventions. Uh, why decision trees? They're uh, my favorite model, probably. Uh, they're one of the most interpretable uh, models uh, out there. Uh, I believe that they uh, um, are structured very much in the same way that we think uh, in how we make decisions. Um, so there's going to be five parts to my, my talk. The first three are going to be focused on uh, more of a machine learning side, uh, in particular on learning decision trees that are uh, uh, optimal. Um, I'll then build on that formulation to learn uh, decision trees that are actually fair uh, and that can capture arbitrary fairness constraints. And um, in doing so, I want to discuss in particular um, the trade-offs between interpretability um, uh, so that you face when you're learning such an uh, interpretable model, um, uh, fairness, and then uh, accuracy. Uh, in doing so, I will also introduce a new metric uh, of interpretability, which will help us quantify um, these trade-offs. In the third part, I'll talk about learning classification trees that are robust to distribution shifts uh, between training and testing data. 
Uh, and then very briefly, I'll touch upon uh, the prescriptive tree uh, framework that we have. We're basically here, we're now uh, moving on from prediction to prescription, trying to make decisions on particular subjects. Uh, and I'll close with a one slider uh, on a package that uh, implements all of these methods. Uh, the, uh, let me go back, actually, in this first part of my talk. This is work by my uh, PhD student, Sina Agae, uh, who's a co-author on all of these uh, papers and who's currently on the job market. Uh, so please reach out to me if you're uh, looking. So um, the focus of this first part of my talk is on learning um, uh, classification trees that are optimal and that can capture uh, um, arbitrary fairness or interpretability constraints uh, that can work on imbalance data sets and so on. So what's a classification tree as a bit of a refresher? Um, uh, it's a binary tree of um, a finite depth. At each branch of the tree, we, make a, um, we perform a test. Uh, if the answer to the test is positive, we go right, otherwise we go left. Uh, this classifies each data point in one of the leaves. At the leaf, we make a single prediction. Uh, uh, for all data points. Uh, and in optimal classification trees, we're trying to make these decisions in a way that's going to have the highest possible accuracy. We're satisfying our constraints. So what's the motivation for this work? Um, so decision trees have a long history, started back in the 1980s with heuristic methods. Um, uh, the issue with those approaches is that uh, although they're super, super fast, like returning solutions uh, in uh, under a second, they um, leave uh, some money on the table, meaning um, um, they could be quite a bit suboptimal. So people have reported perhaps 10% uh, uh, suboptimality. On the um, other end, we have optimization-based approaches uh, for learning decision trees, such as uh, the very first one proposed by uh, Bertima Sanal back in 2017. The issue with these approaches, so although they have great modeling power in theory, the issue with these approaches is that um, they rely on formulations um, that are somewhat weak, which means that uh, in order to obtain meaningful solutions, they need to be uh, worm started with solutions from the heuristic. This precludes basically adding constraints or things like that. And also, ultimately, it means that you obtain a solution that is suboptimal, uh, quite a bit suboptimal if you uh, place a time limit. So our goal is going to be to try and bridge the gap between these two uh, streams of literature. Uh, and our idea in particular is to um, uh, strengthen uh, current formulations. Um, so basically obtain formulations that are provably stronger, resulting in faster solution times and um, uh, solutions that are closer to optimal. So what's the key idea of our approach? Um, well, um, the observe we, we make the following observation, that actually once you fix the structure um, of your uh, tree. So once you fix the branching decisions and the predictions, the um, uh, task of deciding whether a point is correctly classified or not is actually an easy task. Uh, in particular, um, once we fix the branching decisions and the predictions, there's only one place where each data point can land, right? And we can immediately visualize each time a data point enter, enters a node, we can immediately know, okay, uh, if it's a branching node, is it uh, going left or right? If it's a prediction node, is it correctly classified or not? And so this motivates us to uh, think of this uh, task of deciding whether a data point um, is correctly classified or not, like a flow. So we're going to convert our decision tree to a graph by attaching to uh, the root node of the tree, a source node, and to all other trees, uh, all other nodes, in our, and all nodes in our tree, uh, a sync node. And we're going to direct all edges in this graph uh, uh, down, indicating that all data points must flow from top to bottom. Once we do this, uh, the problem of uh, deciding um, on the structure of the tree reduces to selecting for each of the internal nodes, shown in yellow here, uh, uh, which feature we branch on. And then for the uh, uh, terminal nodes, oh, sorry, I should have said, uh, for the yellow nodes, we're also going to allow early stopping. So we could decide which feature to branch on, or we could say we're not going to branch, we're just going to make a prediction here, in which case we can like think of the remaining um, graph as being pruned out. And at the terminal nodes, we're always going to uh, predict a class. And this is going to be useless, obviously, if we have uh, made a prediction uh, higher up in the tree. Now, um, with those decisions, we have fixed the structure of the tree. And now my claim 
is that with this structure fixed, we can, uh, for each data point, build a graph that consists of only a subset of the edges in the original graph. This subset of the edges, uh, which I'm showing, for example, for two data points here in grid, correspond just to the um, edges that our data point is allowed to traverse. You can think of all capacities in the other edges being set to zero. For example, here with data point one, we're saying, well, if it enters node one, the data point will have to go left based on the uh, branching decision we have made. It cannot, go, uh, it cannot go right, and we're not making a prediction, therefore it cannot be directed to the sink. I should have said here, the sink, the role of the sink is going to be to collect all of the data points that are going to be correctly classified. Okay. Um, so with this in mind, right, we have for each data point an induced uh, graph. And now the problem of deciding whether a data point is correctly classified or not reduces to checking whether we can have a flow of one traverse our tree. Indeed, if I look at the data point on the left here, uh, what would it do? It would enter node 1, then be directed to node 2, and be directed to the sink, because at node 2 we're making a prediction. Turns out this data point is correctly classified, so it's allowed to reach the sink. Uh, on the other hand, if I look at the graph induced by data point 2 here, this data point is incorrectly classified, because it would reach node 6, at which point is not correctly classified, so um, uh, it cannot reach the sink. Okay. Any questions about this? All right. So now, Sorry, yeah. Uh, with the picture there, so what does the edges going from two to four to the sink on the second case indicate? Two to four, and so, yeah. What what are those? Edges? Why are those edges present? Oh, so data point two. Uh, sorry, data point two. If it were to reach node two, it would have to go left based it, on the but feature. But it never value. reaches node two, right? Oh, right. But if it were to reach. Like, so it's a subset of the edges. It's easier to represent it this way. You're right, in practice, that data point would never be able to reach that uh, edge. You're right. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this subgraph that is induced of the, of the green edges can be uh, disconnected? For example. Yes, 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 completely. Mm -hmm. All right. So... Um, with these ideas in mind, we can formulate an integer program as follows. You don't have to look at the details, I just want to give you the big picture here. The main decision variables of these problems are, of this problem are some B variables that are the branching decisions and W variables that are the um, uh, predictions at the, um, at the nodes. The other variables are the flow variables. We have one for each edge for each data point that's going to decide where each data point travels. So big picture here, the first set of constraints are just going to say that at each node, I can either branch or predict if it's an internal node, or if it's a, a leaf node, I must predict. The next set of constraints are flow conservation constraints. They say if a data point enters a node, it must exit through one of the uh, uh, um, edges that flow down. The last three constraints, the, the last, the third set of constraints is a, um, helps us build this induced graph, the green edges, if you will. It caps the arc capacities to zero for the arcs that the data point cannot traverse. And our goal, because we want to um, maximize accuracy, is to maximize the flow of data points to this graph. So for each data point, we'd like it to uh, try and find a way that it could reach the sink. Okay? Here I have a regularization term in the objective that limits uh, the number of branching nodes. So we have a parameter lambda that controls uh, how much we care about accuracy versus uh, um, interpretability, so these branching nodes. So what we demonstrate in our paper is that actually this formulation is uh, stronger than uh, existing formulations from the literature, uh, uh, namely OCT and BNOCT. We also show in our numerical experiments that uh, 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 this results in a sevenfold speed up in terms of solution time. Seven times, you may say, is not sufficient. Uh, uh, and indeed, we can speed up computation further by uh, observing that our formulation has a very nice decomposable structure. So once we fix the branching decisions and the predictions, our uh, problem decomposes by data point. We have one maximum flow problem for each data point. 
And so this motivates us then to devise a Bender's decomposition algorithm for tackling this problem. In the main problem, we're going to optimize over the tree structure and the predictions. In the sub-problem, we're going to fit this, um, we're going to plug in these uh, decisions from the main problem uh, in one sub-problem for each data point. Each of these sub-problems take the, takes the form of a maximum flow uh, problem. Uh, it's, by solving it, we will be able to check if the data point for this tree structure is correctly classified or not. And if it's not correctly classified, it's going to give us a set of constraints to add to the main problem. And by iterating in this fashion, uh, we, we, we can solve our, our IP. What, what is the nature of these constraints? Uh, is it a set of edges that should be added? Yeah, so what we do, let me tell you exactly. So what we do is instead of solving the maximum flow problem, we're going to solve its dual, the minimum cut problem. And basically, these edges involve the optimal solution. This, um, these cuts that we add involve the decision variables of the minimum cut problem. Um, however, we don't solve the minimum cut problem uh, using an LP. It turns out this is uh, slower than using a tailored algorithm that we devised. Uh, and basically, what this algorithm does is it, reads, it returns the edges adjacent to the path followed by the data point. Um, and what we demonstrate is that with this approach, um, all the cuts that we are going to generate um, are facet defining for, uh, uh, for our problem. All right, so let me show you some numerical results now comparing the performance of our approach relative to the state of the art. Um, so these are performance profile graphs. On the x-axis, the first part is uh, time. Uh, and on the y-axis, we will show the number of instances that sold within that time. We have fixed a time limit, limit of 3,600 seconds uh, in, in our solver. Um, a, a, the right part of the graph is going to return the optimality gap of the solver at that limit. Um, and, it's, and on the y-axis, we're then going to show the number of instances that have an optimality gap smaller than that given value. So in general, in these graphs, the higher up you are, the, the better it is. An yeah. instance corresponds to a data set? Yes. Uh, an instance corresponds to a data set. We also uh, do uh, cross-validation, so we solve each of them uh, uh, five times. And uh, you split into balanced and imbalanced uh, post hoc? No, we, in, in advance, we, have, we solve some problems that have a, a regularization, which are imbalanced. So where the regularization parameter in the objective is positive, uh, uh, and others where we have uh, 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 where lambda is zero, so no regularization. The reason for why we split in two is that one of the existing approaches, uh, uh, BinoCT, does not do regularization. So that's the only motivation for splitting into categories. Um, so uh, our approaches here are shown in uh, the fill line, green, uh, that's the Bender's decomposition of the IP, and with a dotted blue line, flow OCT, which is just solving the IP as is. Um, the other two lines are bin OCT and OCT. What we see is that you know, our two approaches dominate existing ones. To give you two data points here, uh, in sample, so this is optimization performance, obviously, we have a 31 times uh, speed up for the case of balanced trees and a 72 times speed up for the case of imbalanced trees. Yes, Rahul. What are the problem sizes in number of samples? Uh, oh, up to several thousand. Yeah. Um, eh, so now the question is, do these uh, improvements in optimization performance translate to out-of-sample performance improvements? And the answer is yes. For example, our Bender's decomposition approach improves out-of-sample performance by up to 8 and 31% uh, relative to uh, bin OCT and OCT respectively. So you're not solving the same problem? What do you mean? I mean, if, I, I thought what you were doing is actually speeding up something that exists already. Well, it, by speeding it up, though, because oh, you, you have a time point. limit, you obtain oh, yeah. a better solution. I see. Yeah. Um, any more questions? I think I saw something. Bistra, you asked the question? No, I was just uh, yeah. back to the data set. I was wondering about like, just what the size is, yeah. like uh, how many branching, like, I guess, how many features, because that gives you the variables. Of we the have a huge system. variety, up to several thousand and up to like 30 or 50 features. Yeah. So then in terms of uh, discrete variables, what size are we talking about here? 
for these memes? Yeah, uh, hundreds of thousands. Uh, what did I want to say, though? Um, uh, something that I'll talk about later on in the FAIR decision trees. So we have in the FAIR um, trees, we have a, a data set that's like 45,000 data points and uh, uh, tens of features. And how we solve that is that we take just a subset of the data at random, um, that is like a few thousand, and we show that compared to heuristic approaches that have uh, that can use all the data, we are still able to obtain better performance uh, out of sample just because we rely on optimization even by using less data, which I think is interesting. Right. But the thing is that the number of data is really going to impact how much your, how many paths you have to check in your like sub-problem part, right? It's not going to actually, the master problem really is more about like the depth of the tree and the number right. of uh, features. Right, but the sub problem has very few, uh, the, it has no uh, binary variables. I know, it's so that's problem. why I was yeah. asking more about the, the number of features yeah. and yeah. the depth of the tree, you're considering that is going to decide the discrete. Right, problem. right, right, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah but the number of features also impacts the number of binary variables, yeah. Um, uh, our approach now is, uh, is very nice from a modeling standpoint because it can capture arbitrary constraints. So, for example, uh, we can include constraints on recall or on precisions. If we have an imbalanced data set, we can also modify the objective function by uh, optimizing balanced accuracy or worst case accuracy. Similarly, it can handle uh, 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 interpretability constraints such as restricting the number of branching nodes or penalizing them and so on. More interestingly, though, what I want to show next is that we can build on this formulation to learn decision trees that are actually uh, fair and therefore suitable to work in this, uh, to, to uh, use in these high stakes settings. This is work led by uh, my undergrad student, uh, Nathan Joe, who's now graduated. So, in the literature uh, on machine learning, many people have proposed like a variety of uh, fairness constraints and, you know, depending on the application, one or the other is useful to, uh, to use. I'm listing here a few of the most popular ones, such as statistical parity, conditional statistical parity, equalized odds, equal opportunity and predictive equality. So how do we, uh, can we implement, um, a, a, how can we augment our original formulation with such fairness constraints? Well, we need to modify a little bit the formulation. Our original formulation only tracked correctly classified data points by having just one sink that is reached if a data point is correctly classified. To um, incorporate these fairness constraints, we need to uh, track both correctly and incorrectly classified data points. The way in which we do this is we modify our flow graph to have as many sinks as there are possible classes, uh, and the data point will reach a particular sink only if this is the prediction that we make for it. Okay? So how would we model the fairness constraint then? For example, statistical parity. Remember statistical parity, what does it say? It says that the probability of receiving the positive class should be equal across all groups, or at least approximately equal. So if y hat here is our prediction, uh, uh, we want that the probability that y hat is 1 should be the same whether we condition on, P, on, on the protected class being P or P prime. So an example where you could use this is, let's say I'm trying to automate decisions to allocate housing resources and that I see uh, that are made in the past, but I want to require that all people have equal chances of getting a particular resource independently of their race. Um, this is um, a requirement that uh, my collaborators, for example, at LASA care about. So how can you model this? Is there a multi-class? Uh, generalization of this? Yeah, that's very good. So most of the uh, uh, fairness literature assumes that you have just two classes. Um, theoretically, you could build variants of these uh, fairness notions to the multi-class setting, but uh, um, as far as I know, not many people have touched upon that. Yeah, no, no one has touched upon that. Uh, so how would you uh, model this? Well, this would be just a linear constraint. Let's say I want the two probabilities to be within delta of one another. The first term would look at all data points with protected class P that are routed to the sink where we predict the uh, positive class. And same for the second term. We want these two numbers to be close. So just uh, a constraint that can be linearized and added to the, uh, to the problem. So I won't bore you with the details of this. What I want to instead talk about is a little bit um, uh, uh, about the trade-off between, you know, having a very interpretable model such as decision trees and then, uh, you know, how fair or how accurate uh, we can be. 
Um, uh, we have measures of fairness, right? That's one example I mentioned before. And we have measures of accuracy, obviously, but there's no metric of interpretability. So it's hard to say, you know, by having a more interpretable model, uh, what am I paying exactly in terms of fairness and accuracy and, and vice versa. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, the only metric that exists for quantifying interpretability is sparsity. Uh, the issue with sparsity, though, is that it does not translate well between different models. For example, you know, is a decision tree more interpretable or is a regression, uh, a linear regression more interpretable? Um, so what we propose is a new interpretability uh, metric that we're going to call decision complexity. So how does this work? It says, given a trained classifier, what is the minimum number of parameters that I need to make a decision on a new data point that I have not, to make a prediction on a new data point that I have not seen before? Um, so what's an example? Like in a binary classification tree, to make a decision, I need to know the, which um, feature I'm branching on at each node and then the prediction at the, at the leaf nodes. So it's just a number of nodes, the, the decision complexity. For a random forest building on binary classification trees, it would be across all trees, the sum of the number of nodes. In linear on logistic regression, I would need uh, to know uh, uh, the coefficients of all of the features. Uh, so it's a number of features, the decision complexity, and so on and so forth. So in this way, now we have a metric that uh, 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 cuts across all models and that can help us quantify which model is more interpretable. Um, it's also uh, quite an interpretable metric, I would like to argue. So let me show you some numerical results here. Yeah. Does this have anything to do with uh, like DC dimension or because Not that's that a more think... classical notion yeah. of model complexity? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think it's related, but um, maybe we can think about it. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Do you? Yeah, no, fair enough. Uh, I think at least it's more interpretable to discuss with like laymen, right? To say, oh, this is how I'm going to measure how interpretable my model is as opposed to the VC dimension. Um, so uh, let me show you some numerical results on three of the most popular data sets uh, in the fairness literature uh, that vary in size from uh, 1,000 data points to 45,000 data points. Uh, we looked here at several uh, ML models. Uh, uh, we have our trees of depths one, two, and three, logistic regression, decision tree building a, built using a heuristic, uh, k-nearest neighbors, uh, SVM, a neural network and a random forest. Um, I report here the decision complexity for these three data sets and then also two uh, qualitative notions of interpretability from the literature. The first one is simulatability and the second one is uh, scope. Uh, simulatability relates to how uh, well a human can reason about uh, a part of uh, the decision process, whereas uh, uh, scope uh, can be, uh, uh, takes two values, global or local uh, interpretability. Uh, and the, the question is, well, can a human being actually uh, understand the decision process, the big picture of the decision process as a whole? Um, or on the other hand, as in local interpretability, can they just reason about uh, why a particular data point is classified in a particular way? So to give you a concrete example, um, like in... Um, in K nearest neighbors, it's really hard to understand how data points are classified as a whole, right? And why they're classified this way. On the other hand, if I look at a particular data point, it's very easy to convince myself that, well, it's going to be classified like its neighbors. Okay. Um, so, um, so what we have here is basically an ordering uh, of, of these models from the most interpretable to the least interpretable in terms of both simulatability and scope. These are very broad categories, not um, very uh, quantifiable. We can instead look at decision complexity, which gives you really a precise number for any given data set and model of uh, uh, how interpretable that is. And so we see, for example, you know, a full tree of depth one would be a lot more interpretable than a, a, a random forest, say. 
So we're going to compare our approach to um, uh, uh, state-of-the-art methods from the literature, in particular an optimization-based approach with uh, regularization in the objective uh, to impose fairness, and then several uh, heuristic methods uh, that uh, range from uh, optimization, from uh, sorry, in-processing to uh, pre-processing and post-processing. Okay, so kind of capturing uh, the whole uh, uh, picture here. We have different fairness definitions that each of these approaches can capture. So, you know, we could do five methods, uh, five uh, fairness constraints using our methods. Some of these can do just a subset of them um, uh, that we list and we're going to compare to all of them that uh, apply in each case. In terms of models, we look at decision trees um, built using, using our approaches, decision trees look, built using heuristic, and then uh, these uh, three methods here are uh, model agnostic, so we try them with six different models uh, uh, that, are, uh, that vary from more to less interpretable. And here I'm showing the results. So on the x-axis, we're showing disparity. Uh, the higher the number, the bigger the disparity. On the y-axis, I'm showing uh, accuracy. These are out-of-sample numbers. Each column is a different uh, metric of fairness. Uh, I, I'm not showing conditional statistical parity here because there's only one other method that could do it. Um, and, on the, uh, uh, and then each row represents a different data set. So clearly on this figure, we want to be as much to the top and to the left as possible. However, uh, uh, I argue that interpretability matters. So we've classified models by color based on how interpretable they are. The darker, the more interpretable we are. So ideally, you'd like to be as on top and to the left as possible. You may be willing to be, pay a bit of a price in accuracy for any level of disparity, provided this gives you interpretability. Okay? So what we see here is that our models, which are the dark lines basically, are uh, across all data sets pay a very low price of uh, uh, interpretability. Um, a, a, in particular, the models that do better are highly non-interpretable, such, uh, such as random forests or neural networks. Um, a, on the other hand, also our approach helps you really trade off between fairness and accuracy because it traces typically very nice like long lines. So you can choose where to position yourself on this curve. Uh, are there any questions? Okay. Uh, so let me move on to the third uh, part of my talk, which is concerned with, learn with learning classification trees, robust distribution shifts, and I'm going to thank Bartolomeo here for doing an introduction to, uh, uh, to robust optimization, so I can skip that. Um, so what's the motivation for this work? Um, it, 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 with my colleagues, we have a big collaboration with the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, uh, 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 with many organizations across LA and uh, the University of Missouri, which basically brings together an interdisciplinary team of social scientists, data scientists, computer scientists. Um, let me just start giving you a little bit of background before presenting what this project is about. So uh, how does housing allocation in LA work? This is the problem uh, uh, that LASA tasks us to solving to improve housing allocation. Uh, well, you have individuals experiencing homelessness that arrive in the system. They answer a survey of very personal questions based on their lived ex experiences. Uh, uh, and depending on how they answer the survey, they get directed towards the appropriate uh, resources. Um, so let's uh, now see what this project was about. So there were three rough parts in this project. The first two are concerned with the actual process and assessment of this uh, tool for matching people to resources. In particular, um, the uh, social science part of the team was looking at the questions. Uh, how are they framed? Are they appropriate? Uh, and at the process, when and where are these questions asked? And um, a, a, so let's see what this could uh, look like. Here I've taken a zoom out version of the survey. Don't care about the details. Let me zoom into just one question. The question says, do you ever do things that may be considered to be risky, like exchange sex for money, run drugs for someone, have unprotected sex with someone you don't know, share a needle or anything like that? So various observations. This is a super personal question, right? That you're asked by someone you may not really know. Uh, that you just met on the street, that, you know, they may be a social worker, but still. Uh, and also it's com somewhat ambiguous. It's, it says, or anything like that. So what I interpret as, or anything like that, what you interpret, it may be very different. 
okay? So the qualitative part of uh, the team is changing these questions, right? How they're asked. So the, the content, the, the actual like substance may remain the same of the question, but still they change the phrasing and they change when and how they conduct the survey. On our side though, we're taking the data and we're building models. We're like, okay, let's try to predict how vulnerable someone is, or let's try to uh, 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 make decisions on how to match people to resources. Well, there's an issue with that, right? Uh, in that we're going to see a shift in the distribution of the data between training and testing. So if we train our model with the training data and we assume it's going to look the same in the test phase, uh, we may see a severe deterioration in performance when we actually deploy. And indeed, so here what I did is I took a very simple example, a data set from the, from the machine learning repository, and we did the following exercise. We say, okay, let's say I train uh, uh, an optimal classification tree, okay, on this data set. What would be my accuracy on the test set that I predicted? We got 87%, the uh, uh, dashed line. Now, let's say that this data set, the test data, is actually looking different. So we perturbed some of the entries, okay, and we did this exercise like 100 times, I don't remember. Uh, and we report here the green distribution, which is the accuracy on this, the distribution of accuracies on this test data. Um, what we see is that there can be actually significant deterioration in performance with accuracy dropping from the 87 that we were expecting to 75. So this motivated us to try and build an approach that's going to be robust to these distribution shifts. And uh, in particular, we're going to build on uh, robust optimization in order to do so. Thank you again, Bartolomeo. So, in, in our uh, um, work, we're going to focus on discrete data sets because most of the social science data sets that we encounter are actually discrete, meaning that uh, features are either discrete levels or categorical and so on, either integer or categorical. Uh, for this talk, I'm focusing on the integer and unbounded case. This is just to simplify things, but yeah. Sorry, just to, yeah. to digest what yeah. you said. So, it's just a simply saying that the, the, the data set that you are uh, training uh, is, uh, I mean, your testing is out of distribution versus the, the training set, or is more than that? No, that's it. So the, the, yeah, the distribution is different. Uh, it, there is, is some... Is the distribution? Because it seems to me that if you're changing the questions, yeah. so the data that you're getting is, uh, I mean, it can even get to a point in which uh, uh, they're representing a different thing, right? I mean, in a certain sense. Right. So, you know, the idea of rephrasing those questions is they will still remain the same in substance. Um, so, you know, the way I see it is, is it will change people, uh, how people answer, but not like, you know, it's not that they were answering random stuff before. Um, so in order to apply this in the context that's uh, motivated here, we're working with social scientists to help understand who will change their reply and how do we expect them to change? Um, but, but you're right, it's not, uh, a, it, it has to be somewhat related. There can't be completely random. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that, let me go back uh, one second. Yeah. Uh, so, so what uncertainty set do we propose to work with? So here, this is how we're going to model uncertainty, how we're going to model how the uh, answers to the questions that are posed in this questionnaire is basically change, in other words. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, allow just some of the answers to change by a certain amount. We don't know which ones, we don't know by how much, okay? And we're going to take an adversarial view that we're going to try and design a tree that's going to have the best performance in the worst case of those shifts, okay? Uh, so the Xi here is going to represent the deviations uh, from the nominal data and is my uncertain parameter. The gamma is going to represent the unit cost of deviation. This is a parameter that I feed in. And epsilon is going to be our budget of uncertainty, which is going to be across all features and data points how much we allow of total shifts. 
Now you will tell me, Phoebe, how do you pick gamma and epsilon? I'm not going to go through the details here. The uh, 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 key is that you can calibrate gamma and epsilon based on uh, 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 statistical analysis and hypothesis testing. For example, if you uh, assume that your distribution is symmetric geometric, I can find the right values for the gamma. Okay? So let me get to the optimization part now. So what's the key problem that we want to solve? We want to try and find the branching decisions B and W uh, that encode the tree that are going to have the highest worst case number of correctly classified uh, data points. Um, so we decide the tree structure, then uh, uh, an adversary comes in and decides on the worst case shift. And based on these values, we can evaluate how many data points are correctly classified. This uh, objective function is highly nonlinear. However, we know from the very first part of my talk that we can represent this nonlinear function as the optimal value of a maximum flow problem. This time, though, this maximum flow problem, uh, a, a, its feasible set will depend not only on B and W, but also on this shift. Okay. Um, sorry, let me go back. Uh, 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 this problem, what is it? It's a two-stage robust optimization problem because we have two decision phases. The phase where we decide the Bs and the Ws and the phase when we decide on the flow, where each variable is routed, where each data point is routed. Uh, it is quite challenging in robust optimization literature, uh, not only because the decision variables of the uh, uh, first player are binary, but also because the uncertainty set is discrete. Uh, and so traditional approaches that rely on duality theory uh, uh, will not apply. On the other hand, though, I know that this maximum flow problem uh, that's in the innermost part, I can dualize it following exactly the same approach we had in the first part of my talk. And indeed, by dualizing it, now my max min max problem becomes just a max min problem. Okay? That said, in the minimization here, I have uh, uh, an LP, the Q variables uh, uh, are real valued, but the C variables are still discrete. So how do we solve this? Yes. I have a, a decision yeah. tree question. So what is it really doing? Is it, for example, the threshold value? Will it choose, instead of arbitrary something between two data points, will it choose a threshold value more? Yeah, so, so no, so no, exactly. So it's not necessarily. It, it may, um, so the, the branch, the decision tree decides on which threshold to cut at. The adversary uh, uh, decides how to perturb the data. Uh, and then based on how the data is perturbed, this will change how the data points are routed. So this does not mean that the B and W are going to be such that, you know, as in support vector machines where you have like maximum difference. Uh, there exists a formulation like that in the literature for learning classification trees that does exactly what you describe. The issue with that is that um, a, very quickly, as you increase the level of uncertainty, you come up with a tree that is like depth zero, like no branching because it's so conservative uh, to try to... to um, separate as much as possible the data points. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Um, so now we have this uh, max min problem. You don't need to look at the details. The big picture is the max optimizes over the tree structure again, and the inner minimization uh, identifies the uh, decision variables of the minimum cut problem and the worst case perturbations. Uh, and I had a nice uh, uh, thing on that. Okay. Um, so we're going to again solve this using a decomposition method. In the uh, uh, main problem, we're going to optimize over the tree structure. And in the sub-problem, we're going to identify those adversarial C and Q variables. And we have a, a, a polynomial time algorithm for identifying those adversarial perturbations to add, basically, to the, uh, uh, to the problem iteratively. Uh, you have a question, Timo? No? OK. Um, so very similar to, uh, to what we had before. Um, let me now show you some results. Um, so here we did the same experiment as before. The distribution of the non-robust tree is shown in green, and the distribution of the robust tree, distribution of accuracies on this just one single data set is shown uh, in yellow. As we see, the entire distribution shifted to the right. Worst case performance improved, average case performance improved, best case performance improved, so it seems to be better. 
So we did this exercise now on uh, all the data sets of the UCI uh, repository to which our approach applied. And here I'm showing the results as we are varying lambda. And in particular, on this picture, I'm just showing the performance of the uh, um, worst case accuracy of the robust tree, less the performance of the uh, uh, worst case, in terms of worst case accuracy of the non-robust approach. So we want to be as high as possible. I'm uh, doing two sets of experiments. One where we have the expected perturbation, so where my uncertainty set is kind of correct. Okay, it knows how the distribution is going to shift. And one where we have an expected perturbation where we, est we misestimate the parameters uh, the, um, that are used to calibrate the uncertainty set. We see that across the board, we have uh, better performance than the uh, non-robust tree. In particular, there seems to be a sweet spot across all data sets that if you use lambda in the range 0.75 to 0.85, uh, you're going to do well. Um, one could say, well, you're showing me worst case accuracy, but what about average case performance? The picture is quite similar in average case performance, thank you. Uh, um, and again, you know, for a range 0.75 to 0.85, we have mild improvement uh, in average accuracy, so this seems to be a right choice of values. Uh, in terms of solution times, um, uh, this is the same kind of picture I had before. So again, you know, the more up you are, the better. But here what I'm doing is I'm changing lambda, which is the robustness parameter that uh, uh, is used to tune the, uncertain, the size of the uncertainty set. The smaller uh, the uh, lambda, the more robust are my models. The larger my uncertainty set, the lower the solver times. Okay? Uh, sorry, the, uh, the slower my, my, uh, my solution. Um, all right, so now I talked about machine learning. I just want to have a couple of slides on the prescriptive uh, side. Uh, so before we were making predictions, right? Actually, we can adapt a lot of our work to learn uh, decision trees for uh, assigning interventions. Um, what's the motivation? Well, we're uh, working with uh, collaborators on substance use treatment to help design personalized interventions for assigning uh, uh, individuals suffering from substance use and abuse to, uh, uh, to treatment facilities and to different type of treatments are at treatment facilities. Um, similarly with LASA, what I mentioned earlier, we're using, uh, uh, we're collaborating with LASA to help them design uh, 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 policies for matching people experiencing homelessness to housing resources. So here what's the um, uh, kind of uh, uh, decisions we're making. We're making prescriptions to individuals. So we're designing policies that have the same shape as our decision trees. Uh, we're deciding which features to branch on and then at the leaves this time we're deciding on which treatment to assign or which housing resource to assign and so on. And we'd like to do so in a way that's going to have the best outcomes on the entire population. Um, but the issue is that we need to satisfy at the same time several constraints, such as budget constraints, fairness constraints, for example, having fair outcomes uh, uh, across people from different races in the case of housing allocation, for example. The challenge is that we're, uh, the data that we have in order to uh, a, a learn our policies is observational in nature. In particular, it's not randomized clinical trial uh, data. It's uh, data collected in deployment. Historically, somebody decided to match someone to a particular resource, and we can only see the outcome for that specific match. We don't know what would have happened had that person received a different intervention, and this makes it hard to basically figure out what a good policy uh, is. Um, what we do is that we blend techniques from causal inference and integer optimization that I just described uh, in order to learn these prescriptive trees optimally in a way that we can also capture um, uh, arbitrary constraints. We demonstrate that existing approaches from the literature that try to solve that problem may tell you here is the optimal tree, but actually that tree may assign really bad interventions to uh, individuals um, uh, and maybe in fact severely suboptimal. Um, we uh, demonstrate on the contrary that our method is going to converge provided you have enough data samples uh, uh, and we show that, you know, similar to what I've shown up to now on the machine learning side, we can have significant performance improvements on the intervention assignment uh, side. 
Uh, we're using this in the context of housing allocation and substance use prevention, and these are the students that are uh, working on it. And I'll close with just a uh, one slide pitch to uh, go ahead and use our uh, platform called ODT Learn, Optimal Decision Tree Learning, uh, which implements all of these methods. So you go uh, uh, to, you can go to our GitHub repo and download it now. You fit in, uh, you, you feed your historical data, you feed any constraints you have, you uh, say which tool you want to use, the, you know, machine learning, classification, fair decision trees, prescriptive trees, and you uh, obtain your tree in a very nice uh, interpretable form. Uh, so this concludes my talk with just one line that um, I hope to have convinced you that integer optimization can play a very important role in um, uh, addressing challenges that arise when we're doing prediction and prescription in uh, high stakes uh, settings. I acknowledge uh, funding support that helped uh, 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 us complete this work and thank you all for your time.